Howdy, howdy, howdy. Welcome to a Thursday Collection Connection. Where we're playing that game. It's just an excuse to talk about records. Today, we will be forging a connection between the B-52's self-titled debut album from 1979 and the 2000 album from U2, All That You Can't Leave Behind. And if you're looking at it and saying, hey, I got it. They both have letters and numbers in their band name. No, stop it. Stop it. That's not it. It's kind of it, but that's not it. Okay. <laughs> okay, are we good? All right, good. But first, we have to elucidate you on the connection between R.E.M.'s Dead Letter Office and the B-52's album. And that is that they had one track apiece that was co-written with a J. Ayers whether it's Jerry or Jeremy or Joe is not entirely clear to me. Uh, I've seen it written all three ways, so it's a little confusing, but it is the same guy. Uh, an artist in the Athens uh, music and arts scene at the time, and the song 52 Girls, I believe, was co-written on the B-52's album, and the song Wind Out, or perhaps Wind Out, I'm, think it's, I'm guessing Wind Out though, on Dead Letter Office had a co-write from this uh, mysterious artist Jay Ayers. And so that's the connection. I don't believe anybody got it. So with that, let's get on with the show. So what is this collection connection I hear you say? Well it's a game that I play with my brother and he has a channel called The Plastic Sound Wave Cult. And every Monday, he shows an album. Every Thursday, I show an album. And in an endless chain that's gone on for some 280 or so records now, we find a connection between each album in a row. So that's the game. And in recent times, we've made a change where we ask you to figure out what the connection is that we have come up with between the albums. Just to kind of boost a little engagement uh, to get you guessing in the comments what you think the connection is. So in Eric's last video he talked about the B-52s. I was somewhat surprised to see that I own the L. Here it is. It's right here. And I don't remember buying it. <laughs> Apparently I bought it sometime in late 2020. Uh, maybe when you can get back in stores and I just saw it and without a whole lot of forethought wasn't certainly wasn't shopping for it. I thought hey I'm going to pick that up. The only other B-52s album I have is Whammy, which was one actually that my wife had owned uh, way back in the 80s before we got together. So once our uh, music collections combined way, way back when, then suddenly I had a copy of B-52's Whammy, which I listened to in addition to the uh, debut album. And I have to say that I enjoyed Whammy quite a bit. In the spirit of this last week, which I'll get to, uh, Kind of listening, you know, with an open mind, open ears, uh, trying to be a little less negative than it feels like I've been being in recent weeks. I haven't been crazy about uh, Eric's choices or my choices, it feels like, really. <laughs> Let's figure out what's good about these things. And uh, listening to uh, the first album, obviously, uh, I know Rock Lobster is the one non-cosmic thing, probably, song that most people would know. And... It's a lot of fun. Their aesthetic is wild. The album cover is a classic image. And weirdly, I noticed, you don't think of a band like the B-52s having a logo exactly, but uh, the B-52s is written like that on every single one of their albums. Not necessarily every one of their singles, but uh, they had a clear logo. And you associate that more with the, like metal bands and hard rock bands. I tried to look for a connection uh, using that, but I couldn't find a band that I felt like talking about that had a logo that never changed from the beginning. And I also thought about maybe connecting to the Sugar Cubes, but that felt pretty obvious, and the Sugar Cubes only had really the three albums, and we've done one of them already. And uh, just having uh, a male vocalist in the band who's more of a sort of a yawper than a singer, exactly, some guy who kind of yells things. But I didn't end up going with that either. And since I hadn't given the B-52s a lot of spins up to this point, like I said, I didn't even remember that I had bought it. 
I would say it's good. The the song uh, "There's a Moon in the Sky" called "The Moon" uh, struck my ears as uh, being pretty jamming. And of course, there's the fact that Cindy Wilson and Ricky Wilson uh, were in the band at this time before Ricky Wilson uh, died in 1984 or 85, I think. And we've done a ton of bands that have brothers in the band, uh, so many so that we kind of had it as a sub theme for about seven albums in a row uh, where it wasn't even the connection, but there just happened to be brothers in the bands that we were picking. But a brother and a sister outside of the Osmonds, um, I, I, can't, I don't have another one that, that comes to mind readily. Even the Jacksons kept uh, Janet and LaToya <laughs> out of the band activities. So, so I couldn't find anything to connect with that. And instead, what I connected to uh, was U2, All That You Can't Leave Behind. I thought this was an interesting pick. The connection, I will say, is with the bands and not the specific album. So I could have picked any U2 album. And we've done The Unforgettable Fire uh, just this past summer. But they have a much deeper discography than The Sugar Cubes. And even though I don't have a ton of it, I do have The Unforgettable Fire and The Joshua Tree and Octung Baby. And this one. Those are the four studio albums and then the Songs of Innocence I got that everybody got on their iPhones. But I kind of cared little enough about uh, U2 at that point that I, I wasn't even up in arms and scrambling to remove it from my phone. It's just kind of been there in my library, uh, just kind of unlistened to. And much of U2, save for, I did buy the, the Joshua Tree re-release a couple of years ago, the reissue. Most of their stuff hadn't been played by me since 2016, kind of at the most recent, going back to 2010, 2011 with some of these tracks. And they're just a band that I just sort of stopped caring about. Uh, not so much that I got rid of their albums, but I'm not one to really get rid of albums in the first place. I thought rather than doing the Joshua Tree, which kind of felt like the, the obvious choice, I would go with the, the non-obvious choice, the last one that I bought voluntarily. Uh, from 2000, I had skipped their 90s albums after Octoon Baby. I didn't get Pop or uh, Zuropa. And this album was billed as sort of a return, even the title, uh, All That You Can't Leave Behind, uh, they brought back in the producers, um, Eno and Daniel Lanois, who produced their 80s records, and it was sort of pitched as kind of a return to that 80s aesthetic. But listening to it, it's not really at all. I mean, it is clearly informed by the electronic tangents that they followed through the 90s. It does not sound sonically like their 80s albums. And it isn't the fact their 80s albums to me were reverent. Like they're so serious and so broad and so anthemic that it felt a little bit like going to church. Uh, it's just so reverent of everything that they're singing about. And then they got very ironic and irreverent in the 90s as they tried to do a sort of a meta thing about fame and plasticity and these sort of things. And I would say rather than going back to reverence, it more goes back to a sincerity that was sort of missing from their 1990s albums. Sonically, it's still very informed by the experimentation of the 90s, but they're not quite so concerned with being uh, ironic and sort of over it. Uh, it's more sincere again, but they seem content to just make some nice songs. And it was actually very enjoyable for me to listen to. Uh, you, I, you forget, I guess, over time, as, you've, as your feelings about a band's music sort of becomes enmeshed with your complicated feelings about that band. You know, do I like the guys making the music? If I do or don't, why is that? But really trying to separate, you know, art from artist and just listen to the music uh, it's a really lovely record. It's uplifting without being preachy, rather than making us feel like we're fighting against the end of the world. You know, you've got 
beautiful day. Hey, it's a beautiful day. Uh, you got to walk on, you know. Like, hey, man, you just got to keep on keeping on. And it's uplifting in just a nice way. And it aims much lower than the, than the 80s output of U2. And I think that is to its benefit. It's nice to have an album of songs that are nice to listen to. And I don't think there's really a clunker on here. It gets a little more uh, floaty sort of in the last half of the record. But Beautiful Day, Stuck in a Moment You Can't Get Out Of was one I really liked. And that's one that actually got stuck on to some of my playlists. Uh, so I still hear that one from time to time. Elevation is a stonking good tune. A lot of energy there and really doesn't feel like a song that they would have made before the 90s. Songs like In a Little While and Wild Honey are just sort of concerned with being good songs. And they are good songs. And so I actually had a lot of fun and my wife even commented on it. Uh, she hadn't heard it in long enough. She asked if, she said, is this something that's new? And I said, no, this is that 2000 album before we had kids. Yeah, I will say that, it, that I enjoyed it and it actually got me listening to... Uh, some other things, I have some gaps. In addition to these albums, I, I have the collections, the best of 80 to 90 and the best of 90 to 2000. And in both cases, I got the, the version with the extra disc that had the B-sides and stuff on it because when I bought them, I was still very much of a mind of, just give me everything. Even though I have gone on to not listen to that second disc <laughs> in both cases. And so I even listened to some of that, and I mean, there's a great remix of uh, Even Better Than The Real Thing on one of those discs that makes me want to go back and listen to the original in a way that I, hasn't occurred to me to do, even at the time that felt like kind of a throwaway single to me. So yeah, I've had a nice little reintroduction to you 2 in the last few days, and it was brought on by this album and choosing something less than obvious from their discography. So with that, I will throw that over to Eric and you can look for his response when he makes a connection on Monday on the Plastic Soundwave Cult channel. And in the meantime, we ask you to guess the connection between the B-52s and U2. I won't even say the album because again, the connection is based on the band and I could have picked any album from the U2 discography. So. With that, put your guesses in the comments. Do the like thing, maybe. You know, that's always nice. And, uh, hey, we'll see you next Thursday. But in the meantime, check Eric on Monday. And with that, I've said my piece. So I thank you for watching. Bye-bye.